So I am Megan Claire Chase, um, but I'm also known in the cancer space as Warrior Mexi uh, as well. I live right outside of Atlanta, Georgia in Dunwoody's. Um, I grew up in Macon, Georgia. Um, and my claim to fame there is that I was a former cherry blossom princess in Macon, Georgia. I also have a cat named Nathan Egger, also known as Baby Nady. So I always start uh, telling my story with, I always knew I would get cancer. Like, I just knew it. But I thought it would be ovarian or cervical because it took my parents eight years to even get pregnant. They did multiple rounds of IVF. And then when they did, during that third month, uh, my mother was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And so <laughs> then uh, that was, of course, traumatic, scary. There was no scenario where both of us would survive and thrive. It was either one of us would die and one would live or both of us would die. And it was very dire. And she actually started hemorrhaging to death, which is why I was born three months early. And my maternal grandmother, my Nana, telling our whole entire family, know what's normal for your body because we are all different and that it's your patient right to be pushy. Like she has said that forever. Um, may God rest her soul. Um, and so growing up, I had all of the same issues that my mother did and that my Nana did with my ovaries. And then I kept having abnormal pap smears. So I really seemed to be on that path of one of those cancers. And then I remember I got to have a preventative mammogram covered at the age of 35 because of that link between breast and ovarian. So I go and then they tell me, hey, you are clear. Come back when you're 40. And I'm like, oh, OK, cool. Totally put it out of my head. They never went over the fact that I have dense breast. Um, but my symptoms, and this is what really I feel throws doctors for a loop, is they were very different than my white counterparts. And um, that's why I often tell people, especially those who are Black and of color, that your symptoms may present differently. And so it's up to you to like really push to make your doctors listen. And that's what happened to me. Um, this was, it was about maybe, I started gaining weight um, before that uh, preventative mammogram, but then the weight really just started rapidly happening. And as someone who grew up studying, you know, theater and the ballet, you know, as a cheerleader in college, like I was fit. Okay. And then I'm this weight. So I go to the doctors, they're like, yeah, you just need to lose weight and eat better. But then my hair, now these are all from chemo, these curls here. I never had curly hair, never wanted curly hair. My hair used to be straight into my shoulders. And I remember my stylist who had been doing my hair forever. She's like, are you missing a nutrient? Because your hair is so dry and brittle. And then it started falling out on the left side only. And I'm all like, what? I don't know what is happening. And it, there's more. And this is, again, over a, over a two year period, about two and a half years. I got these tiny green bruises on my lower left leg. So again, I am hyper aware. I'm like, I don't know what my body is trying to tell me here, but this isn't good. So I just kept going to the primary doctor. I kept going to the endocrinologist. I'm like, maybe it's a, a thyroid thing. I don't know. Blood tests kept coming back, you know, clear. You're fine. You just need to lose weight, eat better. Maybe you should sleep a little bit more, get some rest. And I'm just like, okay, these are tiny green bruises. I was like, I'm right handed, right dominant, you know, like I'm trying to make it make sense and it's not making sense. And then it gets even more peculiar. I get what is a circular shaped green bruise on the back of my left arm. So by this point, my primary is finally like, okay, I don't know what your body's trying to tell us, but if that bruise, cause it was just so peculiar um, before that two weeks was up, I went to the dermatologist because I was like, what is this on the outside of my left breast? And she goes, oh, that's a zit. And I'm thinking to myself, that's a very odd place for a zit to be on the outside of your left breast. Now, I guess you're getting where I'm going with all the left side stuff, right? But she gave me a cream and it didn't even hurt. It went away in three days. So I was like, okay, well, maybe she was right. But that just seemed odd to me. But I will never forget. Um, it was August 31st, 
2015, I was um, like that morning when I'd taken a shower, I had not felt anything. But that night when I was taking a shower, and I remember because I used to be a huge fan of the show Supergirl, and it was in its first season, and I was like, yeah, I'm going to get my jammies, like this is my show. And I'm in the shower, and because of that weight gain and my breasts getting bigger, because I never had big boobs before, I was always feeling them. And then I felt it and I was like, what, where did this come from? It was like on the side and it was as hard as a fist and it was huge. And I was like, what? So I already knew it was a mass. I mean, so when I was told, oh yeah, this is a mass. We need to have a biopsy. I didn't freak out or anything because I was like, well, obviously, <laughs> you know, um, but I, I also think I was protecting myself too. Right. Um, but I remember the biopsy and it happened to fall. So on 9-11, 2015, because 9-11, 2015 was a Friday. And I remember I wanted the biopsy. I was the last patient of the day. And um, I just wanted to go home and not have to get back to work and think about it. Right. And I remember she said, the doctor said, yeah, I'm going to take about eight to 10 tissue samples. And it sounds like a staple gun. So to this day, I'm triggered when I hear a loud staple gun. Um, but she pulled, she pulled almost like almost 20 samples because I was counting and I could tell because I'm an empath. I can sense when energy shifts in a room, even though she kept her facial expression totally neutral. I knew she must have seen something. I was like, why else are you taking 10 million samples? But they told me, hey, we'll get the results probably Tuesday or Wednesday of, you know, the next week. So I didn't think anything else of it. I went to work on Monday. My phone rang at 3.05 p.m. that Monday. And I almost didn't answer it, you know, because I was like, I don't know that number. But, you know, my gut was saying, answer the phone. And because I'm a very dramatic person, I'm like running down the hall. And, and of course, you know, <laughs> this is back before. Uh, when I could run, now I have neuropathy, can't really do that, um, to an empty conference room. And she goes, Megan Claire, you have invasive lobular breast cancer. We don't know the stage yet. And that was all. And I was like, wait, just invasive lobular breast cancer. What the heck is invasive lobular? And then I was like, wait, breast can cancer. Cancer? Like I started getting hysterical, but she snapped me back by just being really calm. And she goes, Megan Claire, take a deep breath and I need you to go get a pen and paper because I have very important information to give you. And I was like, okay, well, well, now we know that that had really been growing in me for probably over from eight to 10 years and that it was missed on that mammogram but due to the size of it, it was missed. And so ultimately, once I did get the cancer call, uh, it, I was diagnosed with stage 2A invasive lobular breast cancer. And first of all, lobular is rare in Black women, right? It's already an uncommon one. Only about 10 to 15% of women get lobular. And it's also known as the sneaky cancer because it can mask and look like healthy tissue. So a mammogram does not pick it up, like a preventative mammogram doesn't pick it up. Um, but also, too, I was diagnosed under 40. So that put me in the category of adolescent and young adults, AYA. And now keep in mind, it was two months after my 39th birthday that I get this diagnosis. So I'm not feeling like a young adult. But as I started doing more research, that's when I started to realize, whoa, there's like a whole other underrepresented category. Like it's hard enough that I'm a woman and then I'm a black woman. And now I'm a woman under under 40 years old, diagnosed with cancer. Um, it was about a week and a half. Like everything just moved very quickly. And it seemed to be like, once I got that diagnosis, literally it was a Monday, right? I get the diagnosis. Like I'm probably like mixing two of these up, but like that Wednesday, I, I think I met with the um, oncologist. That Thursday, I met with like the breast cancer surgeon. Then that Friday, I met with the plastic surgeon. And I remember thinking, why do I need a plastic surgeon? Like I wasn't processing that, hey, you're going to need some reconstruction at some point. Like none of it made sense. Discovering I had to get 16 rounds of chemo. So again, I get a call. Like, well, first, you know, I did like meet all the, the doctors and um, have all the tests. And then I had my port uh surgery 
And I remember with the port surgery, again, like I hadn't been like under anesthesia since I was a a kid. So I don't even remember the last time I was at in an actual hospital, right? And it really hit me as I think about it now, how like, even though I was feeling so miserable before the diagnosis and I gained all that weight, I still had some, some energy left, right? I have none of that now. And now it's harder for me <laughs> to bounce back from a surgery, but I, I distinctly remember getting that port and what it felt like to have something foreign inside my body. Like it felt heavy. Uh, it felt strange. And I remember the next day I was going to a luncheon for work um, with all the media um, uh, companies here in Atlanta and got this big old thing, you know, and it was just pretty darn obvious. Again, everyone at that point knew, oh, she's been diagnosed with cancer because from that moment that I got the call to getting all the tests, discovering I had to have 16 rounds of chemo. And I remember thinking, how am I going to pay for this? I'm single. I, I was not making a lot of money at the job I was in. Uh, who knew I was being oppressed all that time? Uh, didn't really realize that. But also like the health insurance wasn't the greatest. And so I'm panicking, like, how am I going to do this? And that kind of stress I had, and due to some technicality of when my insurance was like renewing and when I got diagnosed, I was not eligible for short-term disability. And I remember the person um, on the insurance side, she was so callous. She goes, well, I mean, you really should have thought to, you know, get this um, to add this to your plan. I mean, it's like a broken leg. Like you don't know if you're going to get a broken leg, but one day you will get a broken leg. And I was like, this is cancer. I'll never forget that. And I thought to myself, wow. Is this how it is? I'm the type of person, just naturally a very organized person. And because of my grandparents' influence with my Nana at the time being a registered nurse, I'm glad she wasn't alive there to see me go through cancer because we were very, very close. And then my grandfather was a mortician, so they were literally the perfect couple. Um But they always taught us, make sure you read everything, make sure you like keep track of certain things. So I just already knew to do that, but you're given so much information when you get that diagnosis. I mean, it's like paper here, paper there. This one's yellow. This one's pink. This one's blue. Here's a book. And I'm all like, okay. And I remember just going through tons of paper where it was just all text. Right. And I happened to see where it said, here's the social worker assigned to your oncologist. And I was like, what is the social working do social worker doing there? Like, is this defects? Like, like that didn't make sense to me. I still don't understand that term in oncology. I really don't. But I called it because I didn't know what it was. But I was like, I read everything, so I'm gonna find out. And her name was Catherine. She was my social worker, and she was a godsend because once I spoke with her, I met with her, and she helped me find grants to pay for my chemo to pay for all those tests um, because what people don't realize it's not just about the chemo it's all the other stuff as well like it's every um, time you're going to get your infusion it's all the medications that you get when you start having severe side effects it's the additional scans and all of this stuff all at the same time and I was able to get assistance for like my rent because I was single like if it wasn't for her I honestly don't know what I would have done because I've heard of others where they're just about to start chemo and then they discover that their insurance hasn't won't authorize it. And I just thought to myself, oh my God, this is, now I know why people die or why people um, sometimes have to file for bankruptcy and lose everything when someone gets critically ill. Because when I tallied everything, all the costs of everything, it was almost $400,000, like without insurance. So once the port was placed, um, it was time to start chemo. And that was something too. I remember my doctor saying, okay, um, so we have established that you're going to need 16 rounds of chemo. Oh, and do you want to freeze your eggs? And she said that all in one breath. And so literally all I heard was chemo and that we needed to start quickly. And I, it's like in hindsight now, which is something I advocate about is like, I wish because I was single and not married, 
uh, no partner, no nothing. I'm chronically single, apparently. Um, I didn't think about, hmm, maybe I should get a consultation with a fertility specialist, at least have that conversation. But then that's not even covered, you know, by insurance. I was like, so I didn't think how, uh, how painful, literally and figuratively, uh, that would, that choice would ultimately be. And I wish someone had like, had a conversation with me, like, a day after that saying, hey, I know you just heard a lot of information. I want to go over this quickly and make sure you understand before you start chemo like this Friday. Like, I wish that had happened, but it didn't. Uh, and I, I'm still very angry uh, about that now. But at the time, we could tell, like, the concern with my cancer was it was getting so big that they were like, we've got to first contain it and then shrink it as much as possible. So all I'm thinking about is, dear God, we got we got to get this done because it hadn't gotten um, into the lymph nodes yet. And that's what they were trying to like, you know, stop. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it was, it was very quick. I seem to have gotten the mother load of side effects all at once. Now keep in mind too, I'm working full time. And it wasn't until, it was like the, it was right after the second uh, Red Devil and the other chemo, because I had three different types of chemo, is when the hair started to fall out. And I had to admit it was better, better, it was better to see it come out in tiny hairs than in clumps, uh, so to speak. Um, I got these horrible mouth sores. And so they often give us what's called, and I do not even know like the official name of it, but the magic mouthwash, like literally if you say that in any oncology center, everyone will know what you're talking about to help prevent the mouth sores, your teeth hurt, everything hurts, right? Well, I it only helped a little and I just happened to mention it to my pharmacist at the cancer center and we need to shout out some really good pharmacists. I'll never forget it. Her name was Candace and I just happened to be telling her, I was like, I don't feel like this ma magic mouthwash is really working. I still have these mouth sores. I don't know what's happening. My tongue was starting to turn black. The palms of my hands and feet, these were black. It looked like I was burned. Um, that was freaking me out. And so I remember we were talking. She goes, you know what? She's like, have you ever heard of gel clear? And I'm like, what is that? I said, it sounds perfect since my name is Megan Claire. Um, but it turns out that she was like, you know what? I can get you some gel clear for free. And I was like, you can? She goes, hold on. She made a call. I got like eight boxes of this stuff, which turned out to be a lifesaver for free, no less, sent to my home because I had that kind of communication with her. And she was like, let me help. And so that's why I always want to like tell patients, make sure you're telling the pharmacist too, because they could be huge in coming up with other ideas for you. And it's because, so I would use the magic mouthwash first and then um, swish around with the gel clear, which is clear. And it put a coating around my mouth. I was fine after that. But I had other severe side effects, of course, the nausea, and you really just have to try and stay on top of it before it gets too much, because once it's already out there, you it's really hard to like get, get it back. Uh, to lower. Um, I got really weak. And with one of my chemo treatments, and I had to get on um, that particular chemo uh, once a week for 12 weeks, I had such a severe reaction in the first 15 minutes of the first treatment. So it's about chemo induced peripheral neuropathy. They had told me, hey, you might feel a little neuropathy, some tingling, some numbness in your hands and feet around like the eighth to 10th one, right? So I'm all like, all right, cool. Um, and I did have like my, my hands in like the cold water and the feet in the cold water. Cause they were saying, Hey, we've heard some, from some patients that helps. I literally felt, I'm, I'm so glad I can finally like find the words to describe it. It felt like a current running from my head all the way to my feet. And I felt my nerves just die. Like, and I started screaming in the infusion room. I was like the youngest person in the infusion room and they came over and there was no way to even adjust the dosage because the onset was so quick and permanent at that point. And so by the, I couldn't even walk after. So it was that moment on, I had to use a cane or anytime we, we would go to the cancer center, I'd be in a wheelchair. I had 16 rounds of chemo. So I had the red devil, which is called adriamycin. And then I had the cytoxin. I would have those together It'd be um, one week on, one week off. Uh, uh, and then I had four 
of those. And then I had 12 of the Taxol. And then we had my surgeries and I opted to go for a lipectomy. And what was so great is it was the first time, you know, because I'm thinking I got to have a double mastectomy, like take it away. But that was when I had such a great plastic surgeon and breast cancer um, surgeon. Like they were so good and they worked very well together. Um, he was known as one of the top ones in Atlanta for those under 40. And I remember he told me, he goes, you know, we can conserve your breasts based on where your tumor is, depending on, you know, how big it is once we go in there, because he, they did all of it at once. So it was like, I had like four surgeries in one. Um, and when he told me that he goes, look, he said, even when you have a double mastectomy, that doesn't mean that you couldn't have a recurrence or, you know, were a metastasis. And I was like, wait, what? And so I now know that he did say that word metastasis, but I really didn't hear that until like later. But when he told me, he was like, I can conserve your breasts. So, and I remember asking him, well, what is it going to look like? Like, what are these scars going to look like? He didn't have any black chests of women to show me. And I think it hit him. And I'm thinking to myself, I can't have been the only black person to ask this question, but maybe it was just the way I said it or what have you, but it, it really hit him. Hey, can I have a, can we take a before and after picture of you so I can now show it to other patients? I was like, sure you can. I was like, I really think you need to have more, but you know, baby steps. Um, but I didn't think about the whole like scarring part. For some reason I thought, oh, it's just going to heal and they're going to disappear. <laughs> so what I was told after we had the lumpectomy and it was actually he said that um, my breast cancer surgeon took a whole quadrant of my breast out because though they shrunk it quite a bit they wanted to get such a clear margin that they actually took a quadrant out and then had reconstruction of my left breast and then a reduction in my right breast um and it ultimately I got infections I was told I wouldn't need draining tubes you know because that's what you get when you have the mastectomy or whatever right well I turned into a mermaid my I was filled like they actually had to aspirate 455 cc's of fluid for my breast and he goes god it's so rare that someone with a you know a lumpectomy or, and that is what happened but the crazy thing is and even to this day I'm totally numb on my left outer side I don't know what was going on in there um I think you know again every every body is different with how how they will heal uh mine just got a lot of fluid and then after that is when I had 33 rounds of radiation and I get really mad when others say, oh, radiation was a breeze compared to chemo. I want to set people up for like reality. It may be easier for you. I had a really tough time with chemo. I had an equally tough time with radiation because my flesh actually burned off. Like it burned off. And But I just remember the oncologist, uh, the radiation oncologist said at that time, oh, well, I've seen worse. I... I went nuts. I said, you know what? Until you have been through this, you you haven't seen worse. I have never seen worse. I've never felt worse. Until your flesh burns off, then you come talk to me. And I like refused to deal with her. And they had to bring in someone else because I like lost my mind. Um, and then I was able to finish the 33. Um, and that last three were like the boosters where it's like super targeted, lots of radiation because of the lobular trying to make sure they're killing any, you know, minuscule uh, cancer cells. Uh, it did take a long time to heal. Uh, I will say that. Um, had to get special creams. Because, uh, I mean, I, I'm i still quite traumatized. So every time, you know, I look at it, uh, it's a little traumatic. But also, like, the fatigue was just as bad as the chemo because radiation you have to go every single day with whatever number of radiation treatments that you need and so it was 33 days <laughs> you know every single day I would get it done in the morning and then that fatigue just built and built and built and I'm still trying to work full-time at this point and I'm just like I can't I, I I really thought that it would be the treatments that would kill me not the cancer so here, here's what I say, like right now I'm coming across very confident, right? No, even the most vocal person gets nervous. You feel very vulnerable, very small when you're sitting on the exam table in your little, you know, uh, hospital gown. Like it's very hard to speak up in the moment. So what I always say is 
you know, sometimes you can't speak up in the moment because it's just so much you're trying to process and that is okay. That's, I, I like to say there are different layers to advocacy. And so when you start to think about things, always remember, you can write that in your portal. You can call and ask for your oncologist nurse, like if you're too scared to like bring it up with them, or if you need help with like translation or something like you heard if English is your second language and you heard something that didn't quite translate, like don't be afraid to ask and say, hey, is there a social worker? Is there a nurse navigator? Is there a patient navigator there that I can talk to? Because I don't quite feel comfortable asking my oncologist, which is totally normal and fine. But it's like, make sure that you do ask those questions and always remember that. And that's what's so scary, I think, about cancer treatments and the surgeries is you don't know how your body is going to react to any of it because no one can tell you, yeah, you'll probably get this. No, for other people, they didn't get any neuropathy symptoms. Then why did it happen to me? We don't know. So that's what I would say, you know, is always remember even the most vocal person or even the most educated person, especially when some oncologists actually ultimately become a patient, then they start to see like, oh my God, like it's okay to write your questions out. I would come every day with like a list of questions that I thought of from like the previous time or later that day is to capture it all, but always bring someone with you. Like that, that's my, one of my biggest pieces of advice as you're, as we're talking about these things, because you may be focused on one thing that that doctor said, but they're hearing all the other. Ask if you can record the conversation so you can play it back later. And doctors, nine times out of 10, they will do that.